And Megan Fox here at, at PJ Media is explaining. What's tip four? Uh, well, don't trust women. I think you just touched on that when you were dancing with the stars. You can still love me. I do. I love, well, I love you all the time. But our First Amendment rights are huge. They are very important to me. They are, should be important to everyone. Don't be a public official if you don't want to be filmed, ma'am. Megan Fox. This yes. Is this Good morning. Welcome to the live stream. I'm Megan Fox. I write for PJ Media. And today we are going to be talking to investigative journalist Michael Volpe about um, parental alienation. And it's second winter in New York. We have a we had a blizzard last night. So I'm in my I'm back in my warmies. I'm under a blanket. I've got my hot coffee. <laughs> I, it is so cold now in the spring. Um, in New York, you know, we always have uh, fall, spring, and then second winter before real spring comes. So uh, hopefully it will break in the next couple of days. But we got like two inches on the ground. And coming in now from Chicago, the Windy City is Michael Volpe. He's joining me. And uh, I hear it's not as cold in Chicago, but it's still kind of frigid. Right. It's definitely not spring weather. I think we're in the spring now. But uh, <laughs> I think it got right around 30. So right around freezing yesterday, though it is sunny, so there's no snow on the ground. Um, okay, so the topic today is one that I've been looking at for a long time. So in a sense, if I do this right, this will be like five plus years of research trying to boil down. Um, so we're going to talk not well, only Well, and it's about controversial. We should point out that it's controversial, uh, parental alienation, the topic of parental alienation, because there's a group of parents who say that they were alienated from their children and that a parent, the other parent did it to them. And there's mm -hmm. another group of parents who say, the diagnosis of parental alienation was, was used against me to put my children with an abuser, an actual abuser with credible child abuse allegations. So that's right. the main crux. And you're going to tell us what you know right. after looking at it for all these years. Right. And I should note that if you think the debate over abortion is intense, get a couple of uh, passionate people on either side of parental alienation on yeah, it. Yeah, it is. It's happens. difficult. People are it's, very, very, uh, they, they right. feel very strongly about it on both sides, which is why finding right. the middle, finding what's true is really difficult in this situation because I've seen it on right. both, I've seen right. it from both perspectives. So the, the way I describe it is I do believe the parents who were screwed, but parents do all sorts of things to each other. That doesn't actually make parental alienation real because the diagnosis is very broad, nebulous. Uh, there's no agreement on almost anything. So parents so should may we have define it? Should we define it first? Well, that would Let's be- define that the would, term. That would be great if there was one definition, except there are any number of definitions and they're all say roughly the same thing. But, uh, but essentially it's when during a divorce or custody battle, one parent turns the child or children against the other parent, whatever that may mean. In practice, what I have found is parental alienation means whatever you specifically in your specific situation want it to mean. So I did a story in 2018 about a woman named Julie Goffstein. She, her husband, and their six sons were all Orthodox Jews. One day the husband says, I want to be a Christian. And the rest of the family says, no, we like being Orthodox Jews. And he claimed, well, that alienates me. All right. So him suddenly switching religions and the rest of the family not following him is parental alienation. And I can give you lots of examples and eventually you'll say, well, it sounds like whatever you feel like is parental alienation it could is. Be defined and as that is my problem. Yeah. I definitely am not arguing with any parent about whatever happened in their situation. But if you put them all on, you'd, you'd find out there's so many situations. What does parental alienation mean? So that's one of the problems. But the the major theme that I want to talk about today is there's a cabal globally that's run through the court. And the, if it's not the main player, but a key player is the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts, which is a trade group. And this group. This is that thing that they go to conferences. Uh, the the players in court go to these conferences to be trained right. on family court um new family court philosophy right. or whatever. And we found in St. Louis that almost everyone on our list of players in that court corruption scandal are AFCC members. Correct. Including Elaine Podlowski. And yeah. in fact, this judge this, Burleson, 
right. uh, Je- this, Bruce Hilton. This parental alienation scam was run on Angie. The reason you hear her daughter and the judge doesn't believe her daughter is because the judge is under the impression this is all just a form of parental alienation. Angie That's Kreiner, what, yeah. But what she's You're accused claiming of. that she wants to keep the daughter away from right. the father because of personal animus and not because right. the daughter and said her daughter is saying this because her mom has like whipped her up. I did yeah, a brainwashed story, her somehow brainwashed and- her. So it's not actually happening. Um, and I did another story, Melissa Hagemeyer, her daughter also is alleging sexual molestation. So the worst kind of crimes get covered up by this. She's accused of parental alienation. Avita, the, the, the person. Yeah, Avita Tolu. And in fact, I think they found 10 in the lawsuit. They all, it's some combination of parental alienation. Yeah. And, and so, in those cases, there were hideous uh, evidence of hideous mm-hmm. child abuse kept from the court. And these are, mm-hmm. I'm not talking about, um, you know, just allegations by mom. I'm talking about disclosures by the child over right. and over, repeated disclosures by the child right. Right. and well, the accompanying uh, uh, behavior that comes with children who are abused. So the, you know, uh, some of them were having vomiting problems, stress vomiting and, uh, mm-hmm. wetting their pants to a late. I mean, this is, these are classic symptoms of abuse. And that was what was happening in these cases. How do we define, how do we figure out in our system? Why can't our system decide what is a, uh, a uncredible allegation of abuse and what is a credible allegation of abuse and treat the two differently? Why do we treat them all like they're not credible? Great question. Well, in my opinion, because it's a lot more profitable for a lot of people, I'm going to show you with the first example, just how profitable it can be to the, to make that not credible and to say instead, these aren't actually allegations. These are kids who are the victims of parental alienation, and these thoughts are in their head as a result of it for the profit motive. Uh, and you're right. A lot of the players in St. Louis County and other counties are all AFCC. So uh, if I do this right, I'm going to get a, uh, whoa, hold on. Okay, so I'm going to get an article up, and um, and so this article is one I recently wrote, and it's about a former Major League Baseball player. His name is David Segui. So the first thing we're going to do, so – uh, Mr. Segui has not seen either of his children because he is accused of being a parent alienator. And as part of the like program that the court is running, he can't see his children because that, you know, that would break their protocol. So this is a 16 minute audio that uh, someone in the home where his children live, I assume one, uh, he, he has more than two, but two with this particular woman and her new husband, a guy named Mark Rudzelanik who is also a former Major League Baseball player. In fact, the two of them played together for a couple of years. So hopefully people can hear us. Uh, you have to share it. I don't think it got shared. Oh, hold on. And then you Here we go. Got it. Do that fucking again. How about you do it in front of my dad? How do you do that? Straight into my eyes. He wants to play, we'll play. Where you What's up? All right. So he put um, vinegar in his eyes? So the, the, my understanding was the kid sprayed vinegar into Grudzelani, but not in his eye. And in response, he sprayed vinegar back into the kid's eyes. So first question would be, do you think maybe it's not so much parental alienation that's that's forming the problems with the relationship, but incidents like this. Yeah, maybe it's that they don't have a healthy relationship with mom's new boyfriend. Right, and mom, and mom, so mom is in the in the background. So essentially what happened in this story is uh, the minute they realized that a retired baseball player made, you know, millions and millions of dollars was, was involved. uh, People affiliated with the association of family and conciliation courts sprung into action. He has had at least 15, I counted 15 people. That includes lawyers for both sides. And of course uh, both, both sides can switch lawyers a lot. Um, But I think right there in the middle, uh, but this includes like two therapist interventionists, two therapists. So, so there's, they, they've appointed a therapist and they've appointed a therapist interventionist, even though that's probably the same thing. And all of these people have like slowly until it reaches a crescendo suggested parental alienation. And then the second thing they suggested is 
other cord services that will help with the parental alienation. Of course, now come the experts that get paid big bucks to fix your problem. Now that the courts identified that you have a problem, now mm -hmm. they're going to send the experts in to fix it and drain your bank account while they do it. And but that they usually is, make everything worse. <laughs> and that's exactly the scam that AFCC has. So what, what they do is they put out a lot of research about how significant parental alienation is. But the second bit of research is things like how parental coordinator can help you fix parental alienation, how a best interest attorney or a guardian ad litem. Uh, but the, in, in Arizona, they call them best interest attorney, but it's that's the equivalent of what Podlowski Guardian did. ad litem. Yeah. Right. How therapists, how evaluators. And so what happens is these court actors and judges are all hearing this research. So a judge hears, oh, there might be parental alienation. Oh, we probably need a parenting coordinator. Oh, we should get a parenting coordinator who's affiliated with AFCC. And here you have it, David Sigi, 15. So I'm not going to go through the entire so wait, thing. When you say 15, 15 what? 15 coordinators? 15, 15, 15 people that are court actors, whether wow. a coordinator or a therapist, 15. a lawyer. A lawyer, all mm -hmm. who have been appointed, and again, he's did made he have million, to pay all these people? And he has to pay all of these people. Yeah. The minute they saw a retired baseball player, oh yeah, they went crazy. Pitching. So pitching. this, this <laughs> yeah, is they the, can they can drag this one out forever and drain him dry. There's a long right. he can fight for a long time. Right. So. Yeah. This is what they're ignoring. Uh, Grud Zalonik, there is a police report in September of him threatening the two boys that you saw. Well, you saw one. One, I think, was, yeah. was videotaping it. Uh, the, the mom has been accused of long-term abuse that was reported to the Department of Child Safety. That incident is currently, my understanding, being investigated. Wow. The mom- We're up to three, three reports now on the uh, mom right. and her boyfriend, yeah. After custody was switched at some point, there's another, I think, police report where the boy accuses her of hitting him. And then he ran to a neighbor's and the, and the, the police found him at the neighbor's. And thus far, they're not doing anything about any of those reports, nor are any of those reports changing the ultimate like theme of the of this particular they're case, still accusing is, him of parental alienation and here's here's a small <laughs> but, but how come she doesn't get how come the other side doesn't get any responsibility for having a dysfunctional home or dysfunctional relationships they don't get any responsibility for this maybe the kids don't want to be around that maybe right. they just would rather be with dad or maybe they would right. just rather have equal time i mean right. did they is or he on may, maybe, they, maybe they would have a better relationship with mom if, if there weren't reports that she's hitting them. But <laughs> the, the, the answer is because when you go all in on parental alienation, then the problem is the one parent. And this is a small aside, but Sagi has kids with another woman and there, there's no, it's like he, what he raised those other kids and, and nobody had a problem, but somehow he just, you know, when uh, couldn't figure this one out and suddenly becomes a parent alienator. So that that's, that's another thing, but in order to do this parental alienation scam, you have to ignore this evidence and how much evidence do you have to ignore? If you heard the recording of judge Zellweger, that much evidence where a girl is telling you that it's child molestation and you don't care because you have bought all in to the idea that it's parental alienation. So it can't be anything but that, and um, you know, because you would have a lot to answer for if, in fact, you diagnose this parental alienation. In reality, uh, it's all a bunch of abuse because mm. um, you're then sending kids into an abusive situation. And AFCC is in the middle of this because they're putting out the research, and the research in the end says the way to fix it is to hire our people. They are front and center. Uh, they're on making this industry. Right it's, now, it's a parental upon, alienation industry. So now, I I wanted to at at the the one of his two sons left a message on Celeb Magazine, um, which uh, which also wrote about the case. They were all sent to this camp called uh, Family Bridges, which is what they call reunification camp. And this okay, is okay. Let's 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 right. let's talk about it. reunification camps. Is something I just found out about. And they mm -hmm. sound absolutely horrific. And I would compare them to um, uh, conversion, gay conversion therapy camps. Mm -hmm. uh, and why don't you tell us about that? These reunification camps are used by family courts 
For what right. purpose? So the way that they'll explain it outwardly is it's like the, the kids aren't ready to be with the targeted parent, the parent who's a, the recipient of the alienation. So you take the kids from the alienator, in this case, David Segui, the mom's not ready yet. We need a buffer. So we're going to put in this reunification camp. In reality, they're basically trying to break down the kid's resistance and tell them resistance is futile. You are going to live with your mom. We don't care that you're saying you're being abused. We don't want to hear that. You're going to fix this relationship, period. And these, this particular camp is run by a guy named Dr. Randy Rand, who's out of California, number one, not even Arizona. So they were moved across state lines. Number two, he got himself into trouble. So he never renewed his license when it was time to renew. So he's an unlicensed, out-of-state doctor uh, that they seem to be desperate to send him to. Uh, and so this is the son describing what it was like at the reunification camp. So I'm going to read it. It's a little bit long, but this is good. So they didn't listen to a th single thing I said. Dr. Rand said, I'm a liar and none of the abuse happened and got pissed off anytime I brought it up. I went outside and was talking with the therapeutic interventionist and I told her how are you going to send me to my brother back to her when she abused us? And she told me that I needed both parents in my life. And I said, no, she physically and sexually abused me. And I've been doing perfectly fine with my dad, staying out of trouble, unlike when I was living with her. She mm. also tells me that my brother needs to have both parents and saying it's harder for him since he stopped living with her when he was only eight and maybe he misses her. She blatantly ignores the fact that me and my brother were abused by her and want nothing to do with her. Once we walked back in and said we were not going through with the program, they had my mom contact multiple wilderness, wilderness camps for kids with behavioral issues, and oh they boy. were three months long, and me and my brother were going to be split up. While all of this was happening, he read me the report, and it states that since my dad didn't coerce us to go back to my mom. Coerce, which means persuading an unwilling person to do something by force or threat. I told him, so my dad was supposed to send us back with my mom when we didn't feel safe around her? And he said, yes. And this is Rand he's talking about saying yes. Since I didn't want to be split up for my brother, so I just said, okay, I'll just bullshit the program and go through with it because I don't want to be separated from my little brother. Once we got home and we're living with my mom, me and her got into an argument and she punched me in the face. I waited till everything was quiet and ran. I heard cop cars and I hid in bushes for a while, then knocked on someone's door and told them what happened. They called the cops. I told them what happened. They put me in the cop car so I can give them directions to the place we were staying at. When they interviewed my mom, she lies and said she didn't hit me. The cops come out, said she, he thinks that me and my brothers were wrestling a couple of days before that, and that's why I have a bruise in my face. Mm. The cop contact Child Protective Services and told me, told my mom, we'll call them to come interview us, and they never did. And instead, the therapeutic interventionist comes over and has family meeting. I acted like I was asleep, and she tells my brother I'm having a tough time adjusting and that he should stay with me and make sure I'm okay instead of, of him going to my mom's sister's house. When I wake up, I start arguing with her and my aunt, who's saying everything was so amazing what happened and Van Heil chirps, chirps in saying, it looked like you guys were so happy. And I told her, no, it was all an act. So I don't get separated from my brother and told her I want to go back to my dad. And she told me I can't. My mom has her friend come upstairs and tell, tell us your mom is leaving 1.30 for a court hearing. If you don't have a family meeting with her, they're going to separate you and your brother for three months and 90 days sure. will restart. So we have the meeting. My mom tells me I violated the court order because I ran off and was in the eyesight of an adult. She didn't ask me and my brother if we we're going to listen and respect her. And we tell her no. So she says, I need to leave. We can finish this later. Four days later, I look up family bridges and start reading about other people's cases and tell her I looked it up and I don't trust it's going to be 90 days. These cases spend more. And the Dr. Rand said that he makes these changes permanent. And she says, our case is different. You'll see your dad in 90 days. We keep arguing with her, her fiance and her friend over, the, over and over. And then she says she needs our phones to see what we've looked up. And we weren't allowed to search anything up. We haven't had our phones since. My brother was looking up my dad and, and came across this. 
I will probably get in trouble for this, but I don't care anymore. I'm not going to be silenced by the court any longer, even though this violates the 90-day order and people need to know what goes on in these reunification camps. Doesn't that sound like a lot of uh, a lot of coercion, a lot of coercion. Yeah. And you know, why don't people believe children? I mean, I, I feel like in this age of me too, and all this, you know, mm -hmm. all the comeuppance for sexual harassment and whatnot, and women saying, well, come out, you know, believe me that this happened to me. No one cares when children say and can prove, even when they can prove with bruises right. on their body that I'm being abused. People right. don't listen to them. You know, it's not just, um, you know, the Washington Post wrote about this. Did you read the article in the Washington Post about sure. um, the taking? Do you have right. here? I can share that one. It's right here. Um, let me see. Get that article up. Yeah, uh, let's get that one up because the Washington Post actually um, did this article called They Were Taken from Their Mom to Rebond with Their Dad. It Didn't Go Well. That's also about reunification camps. In fact, they may have mentioned cases out of uh, Family Bridges. Um, so let me, let me get to my next point. So the, I don't know if he is the one who created parental alienation, but the father of this whole movement is a guy named Richard Gardner. And, uh, Gardner was affiliated with Columbia though. Once Columbia realized oh, he was using- Oh, do you using have that video of him? Do we have that video of him? I should find it because it's really good. The one where he says uh, that women ahead. should be thrown in jail. Do we have that? There, there's video of him saying all sorts of coercive things, but yeah. let me let me get up. I wrote an article. Um, uh, oh, you know what? Hold on, I think so. I, I wrote an article called "Making Divorce Pay," and so this is about AFCC, and I went through Gardner. So, um, a couple of things that people should know about him: he's a huge fan of Woody Allen. Uh, in fact, he of Mia Farrow, uh, and I don't know if I'm going to find the exact quote, but he, he said uh, he basically poured uh, cold water on her uh, allegation. And, uh, and that's one reason why he's mentioned in the new documentary uh, about what happened. Um, because uh, he, uh, he was involved in that particular case. Um, so he he said all kinds of things uh here, here we go gardner was one of the chief defenders of woody allen the film director who controversially married and adopted his adopted daughter he said and this is gardner screaming sex abuse is a very effective way to wreak vengeance on a hated spouse so here's a couple of other things that gardner said the determination as to whether an experience will be traumatic is the social attitude towards the, these encounters. Oh, and I hate that so much. <laughs> the, this, is, this is the excuse they use. This is what they said to Caroline about her daughter's abuse. Well, mm -hmm. so basically, what's a little sodomy? If you, don't, right. if you don't overreact, if you don't overreact, she won't. You're overreacting, and the reason why she has a problem with it is because of you. Because right. you're, not, you're not allowing her to get past her trauma. This is so much garbage. Total, total garbage. And it's just basically a way to trap parents because obviously if your child is in danger or in pain, you are going to respond that way. And they're saying it's your response. But here, there's a certain These people of truly believe that child sexual abuse is not harmful. That right. These are the people who actually are, they are advocating mm -hmm for mm -hmm. it to be uh, taken out, out of the context of being socially unacceptable because if we just did that, they would recover. Oh my God, right. it's ridiculous. There is a certain amount of pedophilia in all of us. That's Richard Gardner. Pedophilia is really been say, oh my true God. and false accusations of abuse. Pedophilia has been considered by the norm by the vast majority of individuals in the history of the world. I don't want to say for sure, but I, I I was told that Dr. Randy Rand at one time worked under Richard Gardner. Uh, so he um this is this is the guy who started this thing, and I want to I, I wanted to show one other thing. Um, so there there was a by case. The way, that, that, by right. the way, that that article in the Washington Post that mm -hmm. was about family bridges. So mm -hmm. the, it, it's very well known that these places are not what they mm -hmm. are chalked mm -hmm. up to be, and some mm -hmm. people have very negative experiences, and mm -hmm. yet these family courts keep sentencing children to go to these things. Correct. So I, the, this is, I, I cited a story in 2011, this guy, Henry Bud Carsons, he was eventually convicted of possession of child porn, but the judge for a while, her name, she's a former judge now, Deanne Salcido at one point gave him sole custody. 
And oh, I remember her. She became a whistleblower after this. Right. Here's what she said. So this perfectly encapsulates what AFCC is, is able to do to the culture of family court. From the moment she arrived in family court as a new judge, she says, she was advised by veterans of the system to disbelieve accusations of child or spousal abuse arriving in divorces. I was basically told to be suspect of anyone claiming abuse, she says. I had senior judges telling me, be suspect. The dad probably has a new girlfriend and the mom's upset. The concept of parental alienation, she says, arose in private discussions all the time among court officials who espoused it. So who do you think is the one that's feeding them all of this information about parental alienation? It's coming from AFCC, which is basically the court because it's powerful judges, powerful lawyers, therapists, psychologists, social workers. If you are involved in family court, you have a reason to join. And joining is like paying their fee. Uh, and then I actually have video of that judge uh, talking mm -hmm. about she mm -hmm. became a whistleblower afterwards mm -hmm. because she put children in danger because mm -hmm. of what she was trained. Should we play that? Please. Because this is really good. Um, mm -hmm. And this is Deanne Salcedo. This is the judge yeah, Deanne, who at, this one, is the judge. at one point gave uh, custody to that child molester. Right, let's watch this. And also what really goes on behind the bench. It's a jungle. It's a circus. And there's uh, no ringmaster to speak of. It's a million dollar industry at which um, the public, the average citizen's interest is lost. Former judge Deanne Salcedo, now a whistleblower. She says family court is a circus and so is the training in judges school, especially for child abuse cases. What I was trained on was to be suspicious of women who brought claims of abuse during a divorce matter. I was told that repeatedly in my first year as a judge, both in training at Monterey County for the new judges school. So not just me, but a whole classroom of new judges in family court. So they were training you to be more suspicious of women. They said be suspicious of the timing of abuse cases, which predominantly it was women. And their mentality was you have to make sure that they're not just trying to be bitter because the husband or the boyfriend has moved on or brought a new girlfriend into the scene. How did that change you? How did that change how you've ruled? Well, I have to admit, um, I can think of one case in my first year that I made a mistake on, and that mistake continues to haunt me. That case, Joyce Murphy's custody dispute. Murphy told Judge Salcido that her husband was sexually abusing their daughter. Salcido didn't buy it. She gave custody to the father, Henry Bud Parson. I was following that be suspicious of the timing of abuse claim mantra that I was trained on. Years later, Parson was convicted of molesting two preteen girls, his daughter's friends. Mm. It hurts my heart right now talking about it. It's the thought of one child having to suffer another day, let alone for more years, and then another child was molested. But at the time I made that decision, I could not have been a, um, a judicial officer more than six to nine months. And I had the benefit of less than 40 hours of family law training, none of which included um, how to uh, investigate child sexual abuse claims. But by the time I realized um, what I had done wrong on that case, I had already started to put the pieces of the puzzle together on my own. Salcido says the problem started with Child Protective Services, known as CPS. She says in her court, CPS investigations of parental child abuse were almost never conclusive. Most claims left unsubstantiated. I had a friend off the record tell me, who worked at CPS, that if CPS um, were to make a claim that affected somebody's custodial rights, they were worried about lawsuits. So in essence, they will put a child in danger because they don't want to be sued or get in trouble? Correct. And... CPS also has a policy where, you know, if a child is considered school age, they don't want to necessarily remove them from the home and put them in foster care because that increases their budget needs, which means taxpayers pay more. And so what I found is this justice system is about dollars and it's not about justice. Um, yeah. So, so that, that, by the way, that training is often 
coming from AFCC. And if it's yes. not, it's coming from places who got some of their knowledge or all of their knowledge from AFCC. It's all interconnected, the, the training. And it this is all AFCC. So um, the next thing I wanted to, to point out, they, they have basically, I think these judges, boilerplate uh, orders that they sign in these cases. So what happened in David Sakis' case is on December 28th, they have this very coercive order throughout in, in the order. It says, if you don't follow, I have the, the right. The judge says his name is Brad Ostrowski to get the cops involved, to have you arrested. It, it immediately starts with parental alienation. And then they couch crazy decisions by saying in the best interest of the child, because in the best interest of the child is what dominates and what hovers over all family court cases. So at one point, Ostrowski says it's in the best interest of the children to have no contact with dad or his family. Now, on what planet is it in the best interest of any children who primarily live with one parent to completely cut that parent out and and their siblings and all of that? But but he says it. But at the same start. time, they don't remove children from mm -hmm. from the parent who has mm -hmm. he's gay. Hey, Megan, I'm losing you. Can you hear me okay or no? I find her training materials. I've seen some of the training. It's it's incredible that they are trained to ignore allegations of abuse and be suspicious of all of them. Now, I think it's perfectly reasonable to do your due diligence and make sure that you're, you, you do an investigation on allegations of child abuse, of course. No one wants anyone to be falsely accused of child abuse. Let's see if we can get uh, Mike back in here. Mike, are you there? I think we lost your, I think your Wi-Fi, we lost your Wi-Fi. Your camera's not working. Um, there you are. All How's right. it going now? Okay. You got right. booted. Yeah, I did. I did lose you for a minute. That's uh, okay. So I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what you were saying. Uh, but that that uh, news report is an excellent uh, sum up of exactly the influence that. And she never mentions AFCC. She may not have even was familiar with AFCC when she was talking about all these things. But that's uh, it. It's a very good uh, explanation of of their influence. So. As I was saying, they, they have these boilerplates. The other thing that was in uh, Sagi's case is the, cow, the, the judge will couch all of his decisions by referencing another expert. So he's like, well, uh, in, in Sagi's case, uh, the, the best interest attorney is the one who filed this motion. So it, basically, it's like the judge is, I'm just going along with the motion. And then Family Bridges was recommended by Diana Vigil, who's another expert. And so they are couching it by, by, by like using the experts that they appointed to make it seem like, well, it's not even my decision. You know, Diane Vigil thinks that yeah. Family Bridges is the way to go. This lady thinks it's time to switch custody. So um, you, you see this court order, right? Uh, are you sharing it? Oh, hold on. You have to share it and then I'll oh, yeah, add it. Yeah, that's screen. right. Okay, hold on. You know, these AFCC conferences, I wonder where they're held. I'm going to look it they're up. Held, they're it's held all over. Fancy, so now, it's held in some fancy hotel with a bunch of so catered food. You, you, you see uh, the this court order. This is a court order. You see it's this, not right? shared with me. I don't see it yet. Uh oh. All right, hold it's on. It's not working. Oh, I know. All right, here we go. There you go. Now you see there it. There it is. All right. Yes. So this is a court order from September five, September seven. It, it references something that happened on September five, September seven, two thousand twelve, in the Rucky case, the case I just I described the most. And uh, so uh, and 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 I I can 
consider this quarter akin to the one that, that David Segui received at the end of December 2020. So, um, so right off the bat, I think uh, he he was supposed to, it's in here, this guy Reitman was supposed to figure out if there's parental alienation. So that's right off the bat. Uh, and then here we go. Uh, so it's in the best interest of the children. So you see how he couches it? They're provided with as much consistency as possible. So what does he order that's in the best interest of the children? Consistency. That the mom petitioner, that's vacate the house. The children's <laughs> aunt, as recommended by the guardian limb, see how he couches that? She'll have temporary physical custody. So Megan, this guy thinks it's in the best interest of the children to not only remove the their their primary caretaker, the mom, but to move in an aunt. But he couches it within the best interest of the children. He mm. it's an emergency order in the same way. Uh, the 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 therapist that they recommend, his name is is Gilbertson. He was recommended by Reitman. They it's basically a standard boilerplate. This order, it's like they all go to the same like 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 central place for these kinds of orders. It was done in an emergency fashion. And again, what's the emergency? Uh, David Segui's kids aren't hungry. They're going to school. Yeah. Right. They're not getting into trouble. The emergency is in the mind of the court that 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 they're so poisoned that the poisoning needs to stop. And it's the same thing in the Rocky. Yeah, you know, it's it's like they're it's like they're um if you have one parent who is uh, the slightest bit aggressive toward the other parent, they mm -hmm. can use the bad relationship. Um, mm -hmm. If there are difficult relationships with the kids, which there are always difficult relationships when you have teenagers, by the way, mm -hmm. you're always going to have teenagers having a mm -hmm. problem with you or your other or your spouse mm -hmm. because they're teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, they're using that to create this uh, scenario where one parent can lose all their rights. And it, this is not okay. This is not even, is this even um, known ab abusive behavior? This is the thing I don't understand. If a child does not want to see a parent, mm -hmm. shouldn't the parent who is the target of that be concerned about their relationship with the child and try to work on that? Right. I, Wouldn't it be I, more effective for that parent to just like go to therapy with that child and figure it out, try and figure it out instead of, a, 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 you know, attacking the other parent as being an alienator? Right. How about just work on your relationship with your kid? Correct. We're talking uh, about teenagers here. Most of the time, these kids are teenagers. Unless, so, I mean, unless the goal is to uh, um, is to create a scenario where the court gets involved to try to fix parental alienation. So. In, in David Segui's case, uh, his son ran to a neighbor. In the Rucky case, the two oldest girls ran away for two and a half years. This is the sort of thing you force kids to do. The two oldest Rucky girls lived with strangers for two and a half years because it was better than living with dad. Look what I, I found on the AFCC mm -hmm. website. I went to mm -hmm. see where their conference, their next conference was, and mm -hmm. it was, uh, it's going to be in Chicago. But this one is a Zoom one, and look what they've called it: when mm -hmm. a child no, rejects a parent, are we part of the problem or the solution? And look at their little, um, their little graph here. Look what they mm -hmm. have here. Is it? It's a, Is it alienation? Alienation? Abuse? Mm -hmm. Gatekeeping? Estrangement? Mm -hmm. What? Right. This and is what the whole thing is about. The whole conference is about parents. Right, but it, 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 the, the central plank will be, here's all the ways we can fix it. Our people can fix it. Uh, and so that's part of the scam. Um, so let me, I, I want to make sure I get this right. So I'm going to share a few things from a news story that uh, that was done on the Rucky case. And I just want to make sure I get it right. Um and all right, so just give me one second. I wonder uh, if there's any, um, I mean, I realize that there are people who believe in parental alienation very seriously and they believe they're mm -hmm. being alienated from their kids. Mm -hmm. If there is there anyone else besides these crazy people who believe in uh, that incest is part of life? Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? For alienation being a thing? 
Okay, so it's not recognized by the Diagnostic Statisticals Manual. That's the American so Psychological Association. It's not recognized by I swear, by the Wi-Fi is going in and out. All right, hold on. I'm going to leave for, for 15 seconds and come back. Okay, we're having Wi-Fi issues. I'm not sure if it's on my end or his, um, but, you know, I'm very, I'm very interested in, I mean, obviously no one wants parents to be alienated from their children purposefully. And if it really is a condition that can happen, a psychological effect or some kind of brainwashing effect, I just need more evidence um, that that's the case. Because what I'm seeing and what Michael's been reporting, I don't seem to see any evidence. I don't, I was just saying, I don't seem to see any evidence, Michael, of, um, other than these couple of quack doctors that you found who are advocating for parental alienation being an actual diagnosable thing. That's what right. concerns me. That's exactly what concerns me. I, but, and so because it's not recognized by the DSM or the ICD, there is no like conformity because that would be one of the things that recognition by the DSM would do because the APA says, here's, here's the standardized way that we want you to do this in order to get to parental alienation. That's key. And, and this is hopefully the parents who say they're alienated can understand my argument. I'm not saying that what happened to you didn't happen. What I'm saying is it's all quackery. They don't know what the difference between an alienated child is and James Dean and Rebel Without a Cause. You know, he was alienated too. Right, 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 team. right. Okay, and so that is a big, that's a big problem. That's a big problem right. because there, um, without you putting a camera in the home all the time and recording the other parent allegedly brainwashing mm -hmm. the child, I would think- How you do you have prove to, it? How do you prove it? And how do you, and so it's not fair uh, to- just accuse and accuse and accuse and not have evidence of it. But at mm -hmm. the same time, you don't want children alienated from the other parent if they don't mm -hmm. need to be. This whole mm -hmm. system is so screwed up. It's right, so but the screwed court, up. The court is not very good at fixing this, no. what, what you call alienation. So no. I'm going to play a few things from, uh, from, from, a, uh, from a report on the Rocky case. A couple of things you want to focus on. Notice when you become a proponent of this thing, it becomes like a boogeyman. Notice the examples they come up with. The second thing is no, notice all that they ignore about David Rucky in order to try to determine this to be parental alienation. So I want to make sure I got it. Uh, okay, hold on. All right. So I'll put up some of the comments while you're uh, doing that. Right. Um, okay. So um, Hopefully, on a relationship. Laura Thompson Here we go. Is a you might want to back it up. At the no, University of Minnesota. She's okay. talking in general, not about the Rocky case. Rights to parenting time are constitutionally protected. One parent might try to keep a child from another. Tactics might range from accusing the other parent of sexually abusing the child to much more subtle methods. The mom presents the child with a toy right before the father is scheduled to come and get the child for parenting time. And, and so the exchange happens with, well, you know, you have, you have this great toy, but now you can't play with it. In the Rucky case, court records show David Rucky believes Sandra Grazzini Rucky convinced their five children, especially the two oldest girls, to team up against him. They're just whipped up in, into this frenzy. His attorney submitted this example, video of what she says shows Sandra and one of the children dropping blank checks from David's then business, along with his social security number and bank account number. Kind of bringing the... Okay, so um, are we up? Yep. Okay, so by the way, Laura Thomas, she's a judge now. How do you, how do you like that? You give, give your kid a toy, that might be parental alienation. Uh, and then their evidence of parental alienation is they may have thrown his bank statements into a garbage can. Um, so they, well, I'll give they, you an example. I'll give you an example though, of something that I did hear from someone I have been talking to who mm -hmm. believes that these tactics are being used on him. Mm -hmm. uh, his child was supposed to come. Uh, his child had said he wanted to live prim primarily with dad and he was ready to say mm -hmm. it in court. And mm -hmm. when the uh, mother's attorney and the mother found out they 
canceled the court hearing, had it rescheduled for over the weekend for the next week, and over the weekend bought him expensive gifts. And mm -hmm. by Monday, he said he didn't care where he lived anymore. Right. And, you know, so I understand how there are people do manipulative right. things like that. Right. Right. They do. Right. But I, I, can't, it's can't say can't say she manipulated them. You have to say parental alienation. Can't say yeah, she bought, I mean, you can't say right. she bought them off. Can't say that. Uh, that's my yeah. problem. When, when you actually get down to the behaviors, just yeah. say the behavior. Say, you know what? In a weekend, she bought my kid off. And next thing you know. I, I know parental alienation, that's a second, and this is like 10 seconds, but, uh, and I want to keep playing. I realized I was going to keep going. Okay. Um, but, but basically, I, no, I agree that happens. It's just, that doesn't make parental alienation real because parental alienation is everything. So that doesn't, what, what's the difference between that? They're trying and, to classify it as a mental disorder and use right. it against people like a mental disorder when it really is just bad behavior. Maybe mm -hmm. we, we should, it's, right. it's, it's manipulative, bad behavior on the part of one parent against the other, which should be able to be recognized as mm -hmm. the evidence shown. Right. right. I mean, instead of. Right. Okay. So I don't now, know. It's a very difficult thing. I don't know what the answer is, Mike. I don't. All right. <laughs> I, I wish I keep, did. So this is now going to get into some of the things David Rucky did. So they're saying it's all Sam and Sandra Rosini Rucky goes by Sam. It's all her fault. But let's let's see some of the things he did. The child into the adult world and, and you know, under her wing and let's do this. Her co-conspirator and we're in this together and your dad's the bad guy. And in an affidavit, Sandra denied they proved that claim. It could really be that the child does not want to see one parent or another, not want to be with them. Michelle McDonald, who started an advocacy group called the Family Innocence Project, is appealing Sandra's case on constitutional grounds. Sandra's argued the kids don't want to see their dad because he's frightened them. She's submitted transcripts of angry voicemails and texts left on the kids' cell phones. This is crazy stuff your mom's doing. What the f is wrong with you? You know what? You don't understand. You She's also submitted a voicemail she believes came from him and includes the sound of what she says is six gunshots, one she says for each family member. David Rucky says he doesn't have a gun. And there's this story. Sat on our kitchen table and said that he was going to shoot all of us with six gunshots. He was going to shoot all of us, my mom included. I think I said was basically, what do you want me to just put a bullet in my head and end it so you don't have to deal with this? Mm -hmm. So uh, could it be that his relationship is soured because he threatens to kill his family? Is that possible? Is it possible that his relationship is soured with his family because he sat them around the kitchen table and said, I'm going to kill you all? And by the way, six is for the five kids and his ex-wife. Uh, and that was six gunshots. And they even tracked where the call came from. And it came from his cell phone. It was the one and only thing that in the mom's trial that they allowed to show uh, evidence wow. of his violence. And one, those, one, those children of hers are older teenagers. No one, Why does no one believe them? It's incredible. They have done amazing things to try and stay out of his control. And right. no one will believe them. They sat down with reporters. They told their story. This Nobody. is so, it's so... What? Upsetting no, to me. The, what about the, them? What about their story? What about their experience? No, nobody cares about that because a lot of people were making a lot of money moving those kids around. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, in in court document evidence of him stalking them. Uh, he was like staring at the house, wouldn't leave around ten thirty. Every time they looked up, he's outside. So maybe David Rucky's having problems with his children because he stalks them. <laughs> Maybe and you know, like he, there's a CPS report about him putting a gun to his kid's head. There's all kinds of stuff, uh, but they ignore all of that. The same thing with David Segui. They ignore it all because you've built a narrative. These two kids ran. They were hidden for two and a half years. His son has run. Uh, there's cases all over the place of kids running, of kids doing all kinds of desperate things because people don't believe them. And mm. so, in in the the last like 10, 15 minutes, I want to. AFCC is a global organization. They are doing this, pushing this research all around the globe. So there's a woman who I've made some contact with, and she's written a book. It's called Everything Will Be All Right. Her name is Samantha Baldwin. So I'm going to play just a few minutes of a Facebook Live. But if you want to hear her whole story, no, and what's her, wait, what's her story? She believed her ex-husband was drugging and molesting their kids. She went to the police. They just like here said not enough evidence. She went to the court. 
the court said he's not dr- when when the test came back positive the court the said drugs. He, he's not drugging them you must have planted it to mm. frame him due to parental alienation if that sounds familiar that's really similar to a woman named Joanne McDowell who I mentioned previously and um it Joanne mm-hmm. McDowell's out of North Carolina. This woman's out of England. She's going to be talking about like a, an American case, but notice, does it sound like she's like their system is that much different from ours? And when the subject of parental alienation comes up, notice what she says about it. So just three minutes with uh, with Samantha Baldwin. Oh, you know what? Hold on one second. Let me make sure I get this right. Um, okay. So this is, as I said, Samantha Baldwin and... Uh, we're just going to listen to her for about three minutes uh, as she talks about parental alienation and parental alienation in her case. So don't take my word for it. Have a look at the interview. He spoke to her as well, David Scott from um, UK Column. So this is a very unscrupulous character. So, you know, how many judges are like this? You know, I go off my case, but I know there are lots of parents, my, you know, because I obviously I was uh, falsely accused by the by the judge of, of the father's crime, but the, I know lots of other parents who it happens to as well. They're not worth the paper they're written on. So I just wanted to, I found this article the other day on Twitter. Um, it was um, a Times Union investigation into New York's family courts um, and it examined um, deaths of children. Um, and their reporting found warning signs were ignored, breakdowns in abuse investigations and a lack of standards in how evaluate uh, accusations are evaluated. So this is concerning the deaths. So we've got um, little children, you know, there were warning signs given. Um, so Basically, from, from so from there, I'm going to, so I'll actually, I'll just mention here. So after children die, questions of standards and biases, family court judges handle dozens of cases a day and lack time to independently investigate allegations that a parent is abusing a child. Often a forensic evaluator is hired to review accusations and give an opinion to the judge who typically follows the evaluator's recommendations. Another key official, the attorney for the child, ideally can provide insight about the truth of allegations as cases proceed. These official, I mean, obviously this is America, so the language is slightly different, slightly different roles, but but essentially it's the same. These officials have power over contentious family court cases, but there are almost no guidelines or standards for them to follow. And critics say they failed in recent cases of child deaths, absent rigorous investigation, an argument called parental alienation has led to abuse allegations being brushed aside. That is exactly what has happened to me. Anyway, so I was going to talk about the, so the case of little Thomas Valva. All right. Thomas Valva is out of Suffolk County. He's the boy who died in his father's care because his father made him sleep in a in a freezing garage the mother accused of parental alienation does it sound like british courts the way she understands them are that much different from ours Mm-mm. no Mm-mm. so let me let me get up this is a tweet from but I think, you know that when all of our elites decide on something they decide it for the entire right. world and they've right. decided to go with the quack theory um of parental alienation and and mm-hmm. and looking at allegations of abuse with skepticism instead of just looking at it for evidence why don't right. we just investigate them in, mm-hmm. there are police entire police and fbi agencies that do this for a living right. they investigate abuse investigate right. it that's all i'm asking investigate the damn allegation if it's not true me, if it's let, false let, and inaccurate won't they find that out you you would think let me show you now this is i think they call her a barrister so she it deals in the courts, but in England, this is her tweet. One of the biggest scandals in our family courts when victims of domestic violence, domestic abuse refuse to support child con- contact with perpetrators, they are found guilty of parental alienation. The court orders their children to live with the abuser. Isn't this continuing the abuse? She may as well have been talking about American courts. She's not, but she may as well have been. Did I lose you, Megan, or no?
Yeah, I don't know what's going on with the with this. It's just really a bad. Issue, so you can get up and we have comments to the stream. I hope that it for you guys because it is to the 